Uh, and welcome to Explaining History Podcast. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the counterculture in the United States during the 1960s, but before we get started today, I'm going to talk a bit to the teachers that regularly listen to the podcast about a couple of webinars I'm going to be co-hosting later this year with Hodder Education. The new A-level history series that gives teachers some fresh perspectives and new energising ideas for their lessons will start on October the 19th with the first webinar um, I'm going to be focusing on modern Britain. For those that tuned in last year, um, I'm sure that you can uh, recall the fun we had. Uh, on November the 2nd, I'll be co-hosting with Alf Wilkinson on uh, Soviet Russia. And then on the 9th of November with Richard Kennett, and we'll all be talking about Nazi Germany. Finally, I'm going to be talking with Helen Snelson uh, on November the 16th, about post-war Germany from 1945 to 91. So, if you're a subscriber to Explaining History, you can get a discount on each booking by following the link that I'm going to put uh, with this podcast and quoting the promotional code WF00 9023, which is also listed below. So that's going to save you 10% on the booking costs. So there are benefits to subscribing. Anyway, uh, let's move on from there. So the counterculture of the 1960s is a fascinating phenomenon. There is a question as to whether uh, too much is really made of, of it, um, and the counterculture itself is an umbrella term for a, a wide range of different cultural and uh, political ideas um, on the left um, that uh, are in opposition to uh, mainstream thinking. The development of a counterculture uh, in America during the 60s shouldn't be seen as the development of an intellectual or cultural left in America in the 60s. This thing, this had uh, long been established. You can look at the development of an anarchist movement in America in the 19th century. A really good book uh, on that is Alex Butterworth's The World That Never Was, um, and the, there is a, a close relationship between the anarchist movement uh, in America uh, and, and that in Europe. There was a real rich um, exchange and kind of uh, interflow of, of ideas. And there had been, uh, in the uh, aftermath of the First World War, the interwar years, um, a very strong um, communist and fellow traveller movement in America. Now, if you've listened to my Fellow Travellers podcast, the Fellow Travellers were members of the, 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 the liberal left who didn't necessarily advocate a communist future for the United States of America, but certainly had huge sympathies for and admiration for the Soviet Union. There was a small but quite robust Trotskyist movement in America too. Trotsky, in his exile in Mexico, was largely surrounded by um, American students and activists, many of a, a rather unfortunately impressionable nature. Um, and he, he relied mainly on um, American uh, benefactors in his, his later years. Uh, the um, journalist... Um, Frieda Kirchway, who later became editor of The Nation, was one of the first um, kind of uh, liberal, uh, left end of the liberal um, elite who found a fascination with Trotsky. And there were a variety of causes, inequalities, injustices uh, in the 20s and 30s that uh, brought... Uh, people into the kind of the um, the milieu and the discourses of, of the left, um, civil rights, female emancipation, and the uh, plight of uh, minorities, particularly um, created a a small but not insignificant um, base for uh, the liberal intellectual left. The um, the working class um, unionized left actually tend not to be part of the what later emerges as a, as a counterculture. These are, um, in a, if anything, quite conservative with a small c. Um, and whilst they uh, protect the rights of working people and ensure that union members are, are well looked after, 
um, or as well looked after as, as can be you know, fought for, um, the penetration of politically and culturally revolutionary ideas into the union movement in America is pretty limited, and even more so during the 1960s under the conditions of the Cold War. So why is it we see this transformation from one kind of left to another by the early 1960s? And the answer is um, Stalinism. The arguments that were put forward um, in uh, America and to a greater extent in Europe as well that were sympathetic towards Stalinism in the 1930s, that saw it as a bulwark against Nazism, that during the 1930s was it was the only economic force capable of really writing the world from the Great Depression, all these kinds of things. Um, the ideas that it represented modernity and progress. There is, uh, after the, the Khrushchev's secret speech, and after the crushing of the Hungarian uprising, uh, there is virtually nothing left. Um, in in these arguments, uh, they have no broad appeal uh, within Europe. They are in tatters, and the um, European and American communist parties see huge droves of young people um, uh, abandoning them, and older people as well, for that matter. The um, the Cold War and the period of McCarthyism had done an Im- immense damage to um, the uh, Communist Party of the USA and the uh, the left um, was in a particularly parlous state after um, but after the uh, the period of uh, the McCarthyist witch hunts uh, and the uh, the Red Scare for the critics of the developing counterculture in the 1960s it was derided as a, a decade of um, lazy thought intellectual uh, posturing um, that produced very little in terms of concrete political ideas and was really um, the uh, the means by which radical politics justified uh, a new sense of exhibitionism and, and consumption. The generation growing up in the mid-1960s who um, had moved to the left, who entertained revolutionary or anarchic ideas, um, and who m- blended those with um, New Age um, uh, ideas, uh, you know, Carlos Castaneda and that sort of thing, uh, or uh, looked to the East, to Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, to uh, th- These were a, a generation that grew up in an age of material abundance, the likes of which their parents, who may have been on an, an older, more traditional left trajectory, uh, had never experienced um, and these were uh, this was a, a generation, whilst they perhaps were loath to admit it, of hyper consumerists. They um, purchased vehicles and clothes and music and uh, the fashions of the era in a way that their parents, who had lived through the Great Depression, would probably never have dreamt of. And part of the excess of the nineteen sixties um, was appalling to a generation that had grown up not just with privation of the 1930s but also with the strict discipline and service mentality and patriotism and conformity that the war brought. In a way I guess this podcast is a continuation of last week's on Barry Goldwater because it shows how um, a society with a fair degree of consensus throughout the uh, the post-war years was starting to fragment in the mid-1960s and how um, polarisation, uh, cultural and ideological polarisation, uh, was starting to occur. The um, What we would think of as hippies, again, a hugely contested term, which I'm not massively comfortable with, Um, on the TV screens in the late 1960s, um, who represented a tiny, tiny, tiny minority of America's youth, and certainly a small minority of the countercultural movement, um, became uh, synonymous in the ideas of people with conservative views as 
um, evidence that something terrible had happened to America in the 1960s, something inexplicably bad, and much of what has happened in American discourse from the 60s onwards has been an attempt, the conservative American discourse anyway, has been an attempt to try to explain this phenomena of why long-haired youth took LSD and entertained these seemingly unpatriotic notions while America was fighting in in Vietnam. And it's probably got a lot to do with the fact that there were the opportunities to do these kinds of things, that uh, affluence and education had afforded the counterculture its um, ability to exist at all. What both seemed to be doing was kind of accelerating the pace of cultural and intellectual change in the 1960s. And that combined with a very, very tumultuous period of of crisis, really, as far as the civil rights movement went and the impact of the Cold War on America and later the um, impact of the Vietnam War on uh, America. Um, You have this very rich, um, fertile kind of history historical landscape for uh, radical intellectual and cultural and social movements um, to develop him. Late 50s and early 60s activism had been tended to be largely statist. The um, optimism of um, that, that was um, palpable um, in 1960 with the um, uh, inauguration of John F. Kennedy, the uh, development of things like the Peace Corps, and a, a belief that um, a faith in the state uh, as a progressive vehicle for social change, particularly under um, sort of young white Americans, um, is replaced in the later 60s with a general suspicion of the state, a belief that the state is part of a, um, a wider system of rule, a kind of a class rule, um, with um, the, uh, the government and American corporate power being largely interchangeable and kind of having all sorts of complex and secret relationships with one another um, I get along with the, the organs of um, state power such as the Department of Defence and the CIA. Led many uh, members of the counterculture, instead of uh, embracing the kind of the spirit of Kennedy, to be profoundly suspicious of it, and the um, the radical critiques of um, the society that were coming from new left figures such as Herbert Marcuse um, during the 1960s, um, you know, helped to to reinforce this view. By the way, if you want to find out about Marcuse. Go back to my uh, Frankfurt School um, podcast, and he's he's featured in there. So what the 60s become, um, partly as a result of the counterculture and what it signifies, um, the, the 60s have become this incredibly important and interesting decade, particularly America's 1960s, um, and it becomes a point of reference for people in many, many years afterwards to return to and to reevaluate, to question, to challenge, to subject, to wonder um, whether this was a, a a turning point in America for decades to come, and people mentally navigate around uh, the nineteen sixties, um, interpreting it, interpreting it for both good and ill. The counterculture is synonymous, synonymous not just with the hippie movement, with with the development of the new left. The Students for a Democratic Society, particularly, and the Youth International Party later on, were the the result of this process that I've already mentioned of um, the the left rejecting Stalinism and the left rejecting, really, the legacy of Lenin as well. Um, Interestingly, at this period of time, Mao is not um, reviled or rejected, and for some, he's uh, seen as... You know, the answer, a great deal of uh, new left thinking comes from the um, critiques on the left of both Stalinism and um, neoliberal capitalism, um, such as the, uh, the Frankfurt School, uh, ver- the, the Frankfurt School's various critiques um, and the question of, um, you know, how it is that something revolutionary, something supposed to be emancipatory, had become so monstrously authoritarianism. And later, um, as you can see a lot of this in Chomsky's thinking, um, who, you know, he, he emerges 
as a, um, a, a vocal critic of the government in the 1970s. He's one of the first, kind of the original uh, Vietnam protest generation. And um, in his book Chomsky on Power, he says that ultimately um, capitalism and um, Soviet communism have a lot in common because they are both uh, systems of power and you find that the people at the top can very easily, if they need to, transition between different ideological positions as long as power is um, the, the power goes unaffected and it's, it's that which they're particularly interested in and there are there is some evidence to suggest this. You can see amongst uh, the Bush neocons uh, a number of former Trotskyites, and also the um, former uh, Soviet Union, uh, the you know various KGB apparatchiks and party members found no problem in emb- embracing capitalism after 1989. In a way, in a way, it's got less to do with the compellingness of the critique. It's got less to do with the kind of the um, skillfulness of the argument, and more to do with the historical circumstances as existed in the mid 1960s. If one wished to be a, a progressive, dissenting figure, um, if one wished to protest against war, against racism, against sexism and homophobia, uh, against poverty and uh, against the uh, um, uh, inroads into the environment that um, American corporate power seemed to be making. It wasn't enough, really, to simply embrace its antithesis in the Soviet Union and Soviet communism. Um, So this is really the development of the new left has got a a lot more to do with the the failings of um, the Soviet system than it has... Um, to do uh, with the the crises of capitalism, though so there were plenty of those afoot in the mid nineteen sixties as well. One of the incubators of the new left is the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement, f- um, which incorporated mainly black activists, but uh, white activists and uh, other ethnic minorities, was uh, an example of idealism. Um, rights consciousness, egalitarianism, uh, and th- it was an open space where these ideas could be freely expressed and reflected for for the most part to other like-minded individuals. Interestingly, uh, Martin Luther King, in by 1968, and this perhaps has some reason to do with him being assassinated, had moved to the left. He was looking at wider questions of capitalism. He was wondering whether um, the oppression of black people was in fact actually embedded, written into uh, American capitalism. Um, And obviously he doesn't get to continue that. But the... uh, And it's not to suggest that um, everybody within the civil rights movement moved to the left. That's certainly not the case. Um, The... um, there are some alumni from the civil rights movement who were clearly on the economic right by the time the 1980s had come around. But there were significant numbers of people who had transitioned from civil rights through a kind of a political process. And you can imagine that marching for um, civil rights and uh, being uh, battered by the, a policeman in the Deep South is an in- intensely and inherently politicising process. And their, the answers that they uh, came to, the conclusions that they came to, was that this was a, a question of capitalism itself. There's an important and interesting way, I, I saw this depicted some time ago, um, in Mad Men, of all things. and It's a TV show that um, is, is magnificent for its subtlety, for its ways of... Um, showing instead of telling, for hinting and implying instead of shouting. And in, I forget which season it was, the uh, advertising agency run by Donald Draper suddenly has an influx of young people, of people in in their, their 20s. And the clients to the agency, baked bean manufacturers and car manufacturers and this kind of thing, keep saying to um Donald Draper and Roger Sterling, these men of the 40s and 50s, 1940s and 50s that is, that they want to know what young people think, what the young, what the youth is saying. And in about 1964, 
it, this kind, this this culture, for want of a better word, had infiltrated television, radio, literature, advertising, and consumerism um, wholesale. And it, it's it was kind of presented as the inanity it is that all of a sudden young people have something more uh, important and interesting to say than anybody else. This is kind of at the heart of some of the presumptions of the counterculture, that the old men of the Cold War really didn't have anything worth listening to, and it was young people that would know uh, and have the answers and, and their dynamism, dynamism and energy would push forth. But the commercial realities of America at the same time, which kind of mirror this, is that there are a lot of young people. There are a lot of young people with lots of consumer power. And advertisers were aware of this, and they knew that it was young people that were likely to buy and spend more. And so the the culture of young people, um, to put it in that very crude terminology, a youth culture, um, really accelerates in the the, the mid-1960s and there are nods within mainstream culture made towards um, the counterculture and rebellion. You know, there's the odd protest song by Bob Dylan or Peter Paul and Mary that make it into uh, into the charts. Films by the end of the decade, such as Easy Rider, which uh, were considered shocking and, and um, outrageous, but which attracted huge audiences, again, um, seemed to echo that something was happening, something widespread and important was happening in the way that young people in, in America were thinking. And in, uh, in many instances, many aspects of the kind of the cultural manifestation of the counterculture, we're not talking about explicit uh, uh, politicised manifestos, but really, notions of freedom and um, the um, you know freedom from the the the, um, uh, the law from the state and from parental control that had kind of always existed in American culture. I mean, go listen to what I said last week about Barry Goldwater. He was talking about you know um, libertarianism and freedom, really from a conservative perspective. I mean, he certainly was no hippie and would have. I had no truck with uh, the anti-Vietnam War movement. But again, there is manifestations of this, this desire for freedom uh, within American culture, however it is articulated. That's not to suggest that this isn't an aspiration held by many people around the world, but it particularly is a recurring one within American discourse. On the subject of the, the political... Um, in uh, 1962, the um, SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, create um, the Port Huron Statement, which is the kind of the great manifesto of the counterculture. Now, if you're writing an essay on the counterculture, it's worth, if you Google Port Huron Statement, you'll find it. It's, it's out there. It's all over the internet. And it is the, um, the kind of the articulation. It's very quite rambly and there's lots of kind of contradictory and diverse bits to it. But it's the articulation of the counterculture's goals or the counterculture's politicised goals as the SDS saw them. But an awful lot of further radical manifestos and the 60s is littered with them draw on the Port Huron statement rather a lot. I suppose one of the ironies of the counterculture is that when it really gets going after Kennedy's death... You know, the 64 to 70. The um, number of social reforms introduced by Lyndon Johnson, um, the war on poverty, the Great Society, uh, fe- federal aid for education, Medicare for the aged, uh, reforming um, uh, immigration law, um, the creation of the National Endowment for Arts and the Humanities, and two historic civil rights laws in 1964 and 1965, you couldn't have hoped for a, uh, a period of greater um, progressive measures domestically. And perhaps one of the explanations for the counterculture in that period is that uh, it's, it doesn't exist in a time of particular... Um, conservative with a small c ascendancy it exists in a time of reform and there's there's nothing like a few reforms to really kind of open the floodgates to 
ambitions and demands um, for, for further reform and taking the pace of reform faster than it can logically go. Um, what you have here as well isn't a kind of a core, uh, core political party, though there are things like the SDS and the Youth International Party. Um, the, you, instead, you have a, um, a movement um, that is very diverse, very disparate, um, often very localised in its um, and, and parochial, uh, looking for change in, in, in particular uh, particular parts of of the USA. Um, a lot of it is kind of united by a, um, a kind of by, by cultural norms, um, you know, music, sexuality, drug use. Um, around the fringes of the movement, are, it, it overlaps with with other um, movements such as the, um, the, the the women's movement and um, the civil rights movement. But actually, I think that the um, movement for female emancipation in America is actually a kind of a thing unto itself. I mean, for example, um, writers like Betty Friedan. Um, who wrote uh, The Feminine Mystique and Helen Gurley Brown who wrote Sex and the Single Girl these aren't countercultural figures these are um, dissent, dissenting figures against a patriarchy but really quite with, with conservative figures um, they they are for the mo- openly discussing ideas of, about female sexuality uh, for the first time, but they are not, you know, smoking uh, joints and waving placards around and saying down with Nixon. They're, they're not. Now the counterculture by the end of the nineteen sixties is being blamed for all sorts of stuff from lawlessness and drug use through to the Manston family murders, of which it's largely blameless. Um, crime and um, urban disorder are in some ways uh, I mean this is again more one for criminologists or sociologists Um, I've got to say I don't fully understand the science behind it but it seems to be more to do with the development of urbanisation and population shifts and um, social mobility and all that kind of stuff Um, and the it, it seems to it just happens to have overlapped with a period of immense social tension uh, in America. But it's, it's also interesting to note how many members of the counterculture um, seemed to exit it once the 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 sixties were over. Um, figures such as Jerry Rubin from the Youth International Party who went on to become part of a um, the uh, among other things the self-help movement and the um, uh, the human potential movement which were the kind of the, the beginnings of modern self-help culture as we understand it now and kind of melded with Californian New Age culture and a, a way of for many for some becoming exceedingly wealthy and it's also important to note the extent to which the, the counterculture's influence is limited. It's, it is uh, the majority of Americans do not experience these things in the 1960s. And the majority of Americans do not uh, access marijuana in the 1960s, go on anti-Vietnam war marches, grow their hair, listen to Jefferson Airplane or The Grateful Dead. The majority of Americans in the 1960s live relatively conservative and um, relatively, for want of a better word, normal um, everyday mainstream existences. Um, And a great many, particularly white Americans, enjoy the comforts of suburbia and the growing prosperity that uh, only starts to really be derailed after about 1968. Um, And it's always in the decades. If you have a decade of immense cultural and social change, it's always the decades after that that you really see it manifest itself. Kind of the 60s aren't the 60s really until the mid-1970s and the changes in sort of sexual politics that develop in the 1970s. You only only really come of age in the 80s and 90s, I think. So um, many, I think what we've got to do as historians is look with critical eyes at the things that TV presents um, or, you know, films like Forrest Gump present to us uh, in simple and, and lurid terms, the counterculture very often in what we think it is. 
Anyway, I hope you found that useful, and um, if you can support the um, crowdfunder campaign we're doing at the moment, just to pay for the hosting and to make sure I can continue um, sending these podcasts out, I'll put the link um, and. Uh, under this podcast as well so um, remember if you're in teaching and you want to attend some of the webinars I'm doing later in the year check out the link and hopefully I'll get to speak to you then all the best thanks bye bye